we're going to introduce the independent two-sample t-test. So the independent two-sample t-test is useful for comparing the mean of two independent groups. Or, in other words, when you have an x variable that's categorical or a factor with two levels, and those groups being independent, and our y variable being a numeric measurement. So there's some pros and cons to comparing independent groups rather than paired or dependent groups. One of the pros is that it's simpler mathematically. If the two groups we're comparing are completely independent of each other, we don't need to worry about any relationship or dependency between the two. Um, one of the cons is that the groups um, may differ other ways other than just the um, treatment that they're given or which group they belong to of X. So if they differ in other ways, so in the example we're going to look at is comparing people who've had a previous brain injury versus people who haven't and looking at the number of hours that they sleep. So people with brain injuries and without may differ in other ways. Right? For example, brain injury, they may be more prone to um, playing sports or exercising. They may be younger or older on average. They be, may be more likely to be males or females. Okay. So um, the nice thing with pairing is that we can have the two groups being um, identical or nearly identical other than the value of x, the injury or non-injury. You can see in this case we obviously can't have someone being in the brain injury and the non-brain injury group. Um, so we have other ways of trying to deal with this, and we'll explore them as we progress through things. Um, we could try matching, right? so we've talked about this before, take someone with a brain injury and match them on certain characteristics to someone in the non-brain injury group. We can also, if it's not brain injuries, but if it's treatments, we can randomly assign people to one of the two treatments, or we can use uh, multivariable methods to try and adjust for these. These are all topics we're going to slowly encounter. For now, we just want to start on how do we compare the mean of two independent groups and build up this test, and then we'll slowly extend it and build in these other concepts that we need to add to it. So the example we're going to look at here is comparing the mean or average number of hours sleep for people who had a brain injury within the past year and people who haven't. We have the summary statistics here. We can see the brain injury group on average is sleeping 8.1 hours, standard deviation of 0.07, and again this tells us on average, right? not quite that, but close enough, on average, how far is an individual's number of hours sleep moving from that sample mean? And we've got 20 people in that group. And in the no brain injury group, we've got 25 people, and they've got a mean of 7.4 and a standard deviation of 0.09. And again, we can compare these two groups using side-by-side -side box plots. So recall, in general, we can test hypotheses, and these compare how far is our estimate in data from what we'd expect it to be if some null hypothesis was true, usually divided by the standard error of the estimate. Or we can build a confidence interval. Take our estimate and tack on a margin of error, which is usually plus or minus about two standard errors of that estimate. Okay, so here, the estimate that we're going to work with is the difference in means. The mean for group one minus the mean for group two. Okay, and I'm just going to label it group one and group two to keep it generic. In our specific example, here we're looking at the mean for the brain injury group minus the mean for the no brain injury group. And if we look specific to our example, we're going to find that 8.1 minus 7.4, which comes out to positive 0.7. So our estimate is that the brain injury group is sleeping about 0.7 hours more on average than the non-brain injury group. Um, of course, this is just an estimate. right? We've learned to think of estimates as one of many we could end up getting. If we got a slightly different set of individuals, we'd get a slightly different estimate. So we need to know something about the standard error of the estimate. Okay. Or in this case, the standard error for the difference in means. And again, let's write out what this is going to tell us. This can help us know on average. And again, I put it in quotes because it's not quite that mathematically. We've gone over this, but close enough we can think of it that way. On average, how far is the estimate, okay, the sample difference in means or the difference in sample means, 
on average. How far is that going to move from the true or the population mean difference mu1 minus mu2? In order to calculate the standard error, and we'll get to that in a moment, we need to make one of two assumptions. We neither, either need to assume at the population level, the standard deviation in the two groups is roughly the same. Okay. The amount that the brain injury group and the non-brain injury group vary about their means is roughly equivalent, or we assume that these are not equal, okay, that one group is more variable than the other. We'll talk a little bit more about this assumption in a, in a separate video and how to estimate the standard error based on if we want to see them at the population level, these two are roughly the same or not. Again, conceptually it's important. Numerically, um, it's not important to focus your attention on how to calculate the standard error depending on which assumption you make. What we're going to do is as we progress through this video, we're going to just work with the assumption that they're not equal, okay? that one group might be a little bit more variable than the other. And if we were to work out the standard error under that assumption, we'd find it comes out to be about 0.24. Right, so again, the interpretation of this, right, on average, the estimate that we get from a sample of data is going to move about 0.24, right, about a quarter of an hour, from the true difference in means in the population. And you'd find, if you were to work with the assumption that these two um, standard deviations at the population level are equal, you're going to get a standard error of 0.245. Okay, so not a big difference practically and not worth getting distracted at, um, at this point. Right? We'd like to focus on the concepts, not the calculations. We're going to start to build up the hypothesis test as well as the confidence interval. Um, let's quickly remind ourselves of the assumptions. Right, so all these parametric methods have certain assumptions. They're usually the same set of assumptions with slight changes depending on the exact Structure, structure of the data. We're going to need to assume the usual. We've got a simple random sample. We've got independent observations. So person one, person two, person three, they're all independent of each other. In this one, we're assuming we've got independent groups. So the brain injury group and the non-brain injury group are independent, so they're different sets of individuals. We've got a large sample size for each group. And again, the guide is bigger than 20. Okay, this is a rough guide. Um, the reality is the more skewed the distribution of each group, the larger our sample size needs to be. And we've seen we need a large sample size in each group or um, each group to be approximately normally distributed. Meaning the distribution of the number of hours of sleep in each of these groups to be approximately normal or symmetrically distributed around its mean. So let's start with the hypothesis test. To do this, we're going to work with the null hypothesis that the difference in means is zero. Right? With that, at the population level, there is no difference in the mean hours of sleep. And again, rather than writing it, the mean of one is equal to the mean of two, the reason we express it as their difference is now we can compare this to an estimate. We've boiled it down to a single number, right? a single number that's going to help us compare um, group one and group two, okay, or test the relationship between x and y. And let's test this versus an Alternative hypothesis that the difference in means, let's say, is not equal to zero. Okay, so we'll do the two-sided test. You can hypothesize that one should be greater than the other. As noted before, we don't want to get too stuck on one-sided versus two-sided. Okay, so now we can approach this in a very similar way as we did before. Here's if our null hypothesis is true. If our null is true, we expect the difference we get in a sample to be zero. Right? We expect these two sample means to be roughly equal or their difference to be zero. What we saw was a difference of 0.07. How often 
will we get the difference of positive 0.07 or negative 0.7? Not 0.07, positive 0.7 or negative 0.7. Again, we're doing the two-sided test. If we wanted to do a one-sided test, we'd just look at the one tail. We wouldn't look at this here. Then we can standardize this and okay, calculate what we're calling test statistics. How far is the estimate we got from what we hypothesize it should be in terms of a standard error? And if you work this out for our example, the estimate we got was 0.7. How far is that from zero? In terms of standard error, instead of 0.24, and this comes out to 2.92. So again, just to have a quick interpretation of that, the estimate that we got in our sample is about 2.9 standard errors above what we'd expect it should be if our null is true. Now, this is right, on the standardized scale, it follows a t-distribution, has some particular degrees of freedom, Again, let's put those aside for now. We'll get to that a little bit later, but we don't want to distract ourselves from, you know, important but technical details. How often will we get an estimate 2.92 standard errors above or 2.92 standard errors below what we expect if the null is true? If you work this out, you're going to find the p-value comes out to be 0.006 or 6 in 1,000. So again, interpretation, if our null hypothesis is true, if there's no difference in the means of these two groups at the population level, the chance of seeing a sample difference of 0.7 hours or more is going to happen about 6 in 1,000 times. With this, we can reject our null hypothesis, so we have evidence to believe the alternative hypothesis is likely true. As we've noted, we should always um, attach a confidence interval with a hypothesis test. It gives us a slightly different look at the same problem. So to do that, let's look at a 95% confidence interval. We're going to go from our estimate, plus or minus the t value, roughly two, standard errors of the estimate. And if you work that out, and so our estimate was 0.7, plus or minus. The t value is roughly 2, so I'll use the rough value of 2. I think somewhere around 2.03 is, is the exact value. Plus 0 0.24. And if you work that out, you're going to get a confidence interval 0.22 up to 1.18. So again, to interpret this, we're 95% confident that on average, um, those with a brain injury within the last year are sleeping somewhere between 0.22 hours more to 1.18 hours more than someone without a brain injury. And again, you can decide, um, apart from being statistically significant, is this scientifically meaningful? Is sleeping 0.2 hours more, okay, looking at the lower end, sleeping 0.2 hours more on average, is that a meaningful difference or not? And this is where context um, becomes important. Again, you can also notice we can use the confidence interval to get the same conclusion we would with the hypothesis test. You can notice that zero is not in here. And again, we're not willing to accept that the difference might be zero, which is the same conclusion we reach when running through the hypothesis test. Right? We rejected this null that the difference in means is zero. And I just want to bring back to a reminder, we won't run through all these ideas, but stuff we talked about earlier when building up hypothesis testing and confidence interval concepts. If this width here, the margin of error is too large, we can control that. We learned about how to make the margin of error and the confidence interval smaller. The best approach to that is trying to increase sample sizes. And we talked about type one or type two errors. So we might be rejecting the null when in fact it's true. We might fail to reject the null when it's false. We talked about power. and What's the probability of rejecting the null if the null is false? All these concepts still apply. Um, as we progress through these ideas, we're going to talk about them less and less because we've laid the foundation for them. So this you know, um, type 1, type 2 errors, width of confidence intervals, margins of errors, sample sizes, 
All these concepts flow through all of these approaches. Thanks for watching our video. Subscribe to our channel. Share our videos. Statistics is almost as yummy as chocolate. Stick around, guys, because we got lots more.